it's really nice to be here um, talking about something very new and, as Sherry was saying, very different. I want to start off with um, an event or a, a phenomenon which is, I think, warming the wonky hearts of those of us who follow things like poverty and inequality, which is that a book, a very wonky big book, 700 pages of charts and tables and figures on inequality is flying off the shelves and on Sunday will be the uh, number two book on the New York Times bestseller list, um, Thomas Piketty's Capital in the 21st Century. I want to start with this because what Piketty does is one very different from what I'm going to talk about, but also notable is that he takes the, the long view in trying to understand the development of the US and other richer countries. And this is the big graph, or one of the big graphs that comes out of the book. And I was looking at it the other day and thinking, well, this is sort of a part of Wagner's story. Wagner was founded, before it was even Wagner, at a time when inequality in the US was at historical highs. The top 10% of the US, in terms of earning, including capital gains um, earnings, was about 45% of total income earned in the country. As Wagner grew and um, moved into its youth, inequality in the US started to fall. The World War II, the Great Depression, and the destruction of wealth there led to a very different um, economy, a very different situation. But the last 40 years had seen a big rise. And this is really Piketty's story. And this is really the, um, so the backdrop to which Wagner and Wagner's faculty and NYU in general has been sort of working and trying to understand how one helps build a stronger country and a stronger globe. Um, while also being concerned that the distribution of gains um, goes broadly. And so alongside that change in inequality is also this. Um, in that same period from 1970 to, 19, uh, to 2010, um, poverty has been flat and it remains flat. And that's really the beginning point of the project that I want to share um, now. One of the things about Piketty's project with the uh, sort of long run historical data is that it gives us a very broad view of things. But it doesn't give us a detailed view of what's happening to the lives of Americans as they get through the year, as they get through um, their day, their week, their months, and how they actually live their lives and how that's changed over time. So we can look at data like this, but it doesn't really give us purchase on how to really think through policy um, that can make people's lives better. And so, one of the things that we're finding that I want to stress in the next few minutes is that our focus has been on inequalities of income and with Piketty's work, increasingly inequalities in wealth. But there's another fundamental inequality that gets lost because we don't see it in the kind of data we have. And that's inequality in steady, reliable, predictable finances. Steady jobs, the ability to know what's going to happen in the next month and the month after that. That there's an inequality that's been growing in America that's along those dimensions and is really changing things um, in terms of the policy environment and possible solutions. The data that we've been focusing on comes from four sites. We decided to just step back from the usual data that gets collected and spend a year with about 250 households, some in Northern California in the agricultural communities around San Jose, some in Eastern Mississippi, southern Ohio, northern Kentucky, and here in Brooklyn and Queens. The idea was to get to know a smaller group of families, but to really get to know them, to try to track every dollar spent, every dollar earned, every dollar borrowed, every dollar saved, and so really have a fine-grained view of a small number of people's lives. And in that way, trying to get away from the sort of annual year-to-year -year data, and for once, take a look at something that's closer to a real diary. And so to capture the day-to-day, week-to-week existence, that is actually how we get through life. So the project involved creating a research group that lived in the different regions and met with families every two to four weeks and built up um, the stories of their lives, built up trust, and got to see strategies and changes in people's lives, challenges, that are usually hard to see and never collected in the kind of data that we usually are um, working with and collecting. 
And so we've been looking at working poor families, about a third of them poor, about a third near poor, and about a third um, in the middle class. Different ethnic groups, different immigration groups. Um, and the kind of the binding insight as we move forward was to follow their income and follow their assets as usual, but do something new and different, which is also very closely follow cash flows. And so it's that focus on cash flows which has really changed the way that we are understanding the economic lives and the financial lives of the households. Over the last few years, we've collected, well, over this one year period for the households, we've collected 300,000 different cash flows for this 250 um, family sample, as well as 460,000 answers to questions on health and uh, tax refunds, financial instruments, aspirations, all those kinds of things that um, we as social scientists think about. So let me tell you about one family to give you a sense of what we're finding in the data. This is the Garza family. They live in Northern California. Ricardo Garza works construction, and he has a pretty steady job in that he earns $400 a week in his construction job. But it's not enough to make ends meet. So he's also got a side job where he's doing a little remodeling with a friend. His wife also is doing a little work um, to make ends meet. She's selling jewelry and um, clothing online, and she's also taking in kids and acting um, as a babysitter, making money in childcare. And this story is really the story that we see again and again, this kind of picture. This is the year, and you can see the income, the total household income going up and down. And it's the ups and downs which create the tensions and challenges in the Garza's life. On average, if we just looked at the annual data, they're doing fine. They earn about, on average, $2,800 a month. They're spending a little less than that. They look fine. But what's hard for the Garzas, and for so many households we're getting to know, is that that $2,800 is just the average. And in some months, they're as low as $1,600. In some months, they have $5,000. So holding on to those gains and dealing with those difficult periods is really the challenge that we're seeing households face. And for the Garzas, they're turning to pawn shops. They're taking on costly loans or maxing out credit cards um, when their income dips. Even though on average, year to year, in the annual data, they're looking fine. We just don't see it in the data we collect. So it's not just the Garzas. This is uh, a graph that shows the swings in income of all the families in Northern California. Um, and they all have these ups and downs um, throughout the year. The ups and downs are coming from a number of different sources. One of the sources is greater instability in labor income. We ask the households, and we look at how stable their um, different jobs are. Uh, about a quarter of them are saying their jobs are not very steady in terms of hours and income, or not steady at all. And we're seeing this playing out in different ways across our sample. But the other thing which is striking, and this goes to that hidden inequality that I started with, is that when we look at the poorest and the least poor, and this is um, this is actually from a national survey that's not ours, but connects to ours. Um, and we look at the, the middle rungs in the distribution. When we look at the volatility of income throughout the year, so the poorest who have the most volatile income, and that the volatility of income gets lower and lower as you get better off. The bottom line is, as income goes up, it's not just that you're earning more money, you're also moving into better jobs. And so the households that have the lowest income are also not only dealing with that, but dealing with the greatest uncertainty and unpredictability in their lives. The households that are least well um, set to deal with that kind of volatility. What that leads to is no surprise. Almost all households in our sample have at least one month where they're spending more than they have. They're running overdrafts on the checking accounts, about half of them. About a quarter of them have two or more um, overdrafts. About Three quarters of them aren't paying their credit card um, credit cards in full from month to month, and about a third of them are maxing out their credit cards and have no room to maneuver. So they're using the devices they have, but the devices aren't working that well for them. The Pew Charitable Trust runs a survey every year, focuses on how American households are doing, and every year they ask this question, which is, if you had to choose, would you rather move up the income ladder, earn more income, but hold everything else the same, 
or keep your income where it is, but have more stability, more financial stability um, than you have now? And the answer to that Pew survey lines up with what we're seeing across the country. In the Pew survey, 85% of the respondents say they would rather have more financial stability and stay where they are than earn extra income. We're seeing that same response. We asked the same question to our households. And for the poor, the near poor, and um, households in the moderate, moderate income middle class, it's all about the same, 70 80% saying it's really financial stability that they're searching for rather than moving up the um, income ladder. And that changes how we think about approaches to poverty in low-income households and changes how we think about policy. Because the problem, essentially, that we're seeing is that households are facing lots of ups and downs in needs and ups and downs in income. And there's this great mismatch. And it's the mismatch which creates all the tension. With better financial services and um, better jobs, hopefully, that mismatch can resolve itself and come into better alignment. And with that, households can be in a much better place. So in terms of policy, we often think about poorer and low-income households and think, well, you know, the finances are difficult. What we really need to do is provide better financial literacy training or help people save, or um, maybe there's some behavioral economics nudges that we could think about to help them. But our evidence shows that that's really insufficient for the households we get to know. They really need better tools not just better advice. And those tools are ways to deal with emergencies better, that really deal with the ups and downs um, much more easily, ways to create lump sums and hold onto them, and ways to clear financial space in order to focus on some of these harder choices. And so when we think about the challenges, and we think about poverty, and we look at data like this, we've got to remember that the annual data is powerful and tells an important story. But behind that data, our households that are not living year to year, they're living week to week and month to month. And that opens up policy possibilities, product possibilities, new ways to think about how to help households that are struggling today move forward. So thank you very much.